Our first reading this morning is uh, from the 107th Psalm, the first through third verses, and the 33rd through 43rd verses. Listen to the word of the Lord as given to us in Psalm 107. This is a thanksgiving for deliverance from many troubles. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he, re- he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry live, and they establish a town to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of distress and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness stops its mouth. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Art. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, verses, or chapter four, verses one through nine, and then again, 26 through 34. A little longer reading than we usually tackle in worship, but it's worth it. Uh, Three parables of Jesus having to do with seeds and the garden, if you will. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. In verse 26, He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, it is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. 
O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, sowing and reaping, reaping and sowing, these are words, words we only use in church, and I still get them mixed up. Last week, Nancy Osborne teased me on the way out of worship and said, you got reaping and sowing mixed up in your sermon. She said, you said, you reap what you sow when it should be you sow what you reap. And here's the funny part. She got it wrong when she was telling me that I got it wrong. <laughs> which I did. I went back and listened to my sermon, and yes, uh, I did get it wrong. Uh, she was right. I was wrong. <laughs> Sowing is planting, and reaping is harvesting. Why don't we just say it that way? And well, sometimes we do, as in the, method, uh, the, the translation that we read from last week, the message. Remember those uh, words, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop, but a lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I like those modern translations sometimes, but when it comes to familiar stories like this one today, I like the traditional language. The parable of the sower sounds better and more profound than the parable of the planter. Whether we call it sowing and reaping or something else, this fourth chapter of Mark's gospel has three parables about seeds, they are known traditionally as the parable of the sower, the parable of the growing seed, and the parable of the mustard seed. And the word parable is also a word we use mostly in church. It's maybe a little old-fashioned, too. It simply means a story, but it's a special kind of story. It's a story drawn from everyday life that teaches a lesson. And in Jesus' day, people lived close to the land, so parables were often stories about farming the soil or tending sheep. Modern day parables in our time might include cell phones and social media. But fortunately, you and I can still relate to these parables about seeds, even, even if we haven't planted or sown seeds for a garden lately. We know what happens when seeds go in the ground. We know that seeds need good soil and water and sunlight to grow. Just two weeks ago, we planted 250 bulbs, hoping to see them grow into bright and cheerful daffodils next spring. Well, as you know, the theme for our stewardship season this year has been growing God's garden. In a sense, it has been a parable about the past, present, and future of PCMK. And like any good parable, this theme that we've had can be interpreted in a variety of ways. We can think of ourselves as the garden in a collective sense. We are God's garden. But it also suggests that we are gardeners, planting seeds, mulching, weeding, and watering God's garden. It also suggests growth, which can represent numeric growth as well as spiritual growth and growth in purpose and meaning. These three parables from Mark are the perfect way, I think, to summarize and wrap up our focus on growing God's garden. Next week, we'll move on to Thanksgiving, and Will Cosnett will bring a sermon I'm looking forward to on forgiveness, which is certainly something to be thankful for. And then it is the first Sunday of Advent, and that special season is suddenly upon us. So for a few more minutes, let's put on our garden gloves and our sun hat. Isn't that fun to think about at this weather <laughs> with all that snow on the ground? Let's go out in the garden one more time and sit and listen to these timeless stories from our Lord. The first parable is the parable of the sower. And a version of this story is in all three Gospels. We, we call them the synoptic Gospels because they are the same in many ways, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in this story, a farmer is casting seed and some of it falls on the path, some on rocky soil, some into the weeds, but some falls on good soil and produces a great harvest. Well, the usual interpretation of this parable is to let it ask the question, what kind of soil are you? Are you good soil that is yielding an abundant harvest of good things like kindness and generosity? Or are you someone who takes the seeds of God's blessings and lets them die in the sun or get choked by weeds? So looking at it this way, you and I are the soil. We are dirt. <laughs> but in this case, dirt is a good thing. In fact, the dirtier, the better. 
Gardeners know how to make rich, fertile soil. They need to add organic material like, how do we say this politely, uh, the byproduct of animals. <laughs> For several years in a row, I attended a conference in Princeton Seminary in April. I was living on the West Coast at the time, and our gardening traditions and calendar are a little different. I'll never forget that pungent smell of springtime in Princeton. At first, I didn't know what on earth it was, but then I was told it was steer manure that was put down on all the planting areas, areas around the campus every spring. I had to admit, the grounds were beautiful, so I guess it must work, but whew, what a smell. The obvious lesson for us is to be good soil, to be receptive to God's seeds of love, forgiveness, and compassion, and let those seeds grow in us and in our church. We need to do the hard work of gardening. We need to invest in our future together through the giving of our time, talent, and treasure. So that's the stewardship message of this parable. And I'm thankful to say that I believe we are good soil. We are responding to God's generosity with generosity of our own, and God's garden is growing. But there is another lesson in this story that we should not overlook. The parable makes it clear that the sower knows that some seed is falling on these less fertile places. And yet it is important to cast that seed widely and not confine it just to the good soil. And one interpretation could be to remind us that God spreads seeds of love and compassion even upon those that reject it and walk away from it. And you and I should also be willing to go into those hard places and spread the seeds of God's love. Places like prisons and the hard streets of New York City with ministries like the Midnight Run. We may not see our harvest right away or ever, but still it is important to cast the seed because you never know where there's a little bit of good soil. And the second parable is less well known, but it has an important lesson for us, I think. The parable of the growing seed simply observes that a farmer plants seeds and then goes to bed. And after many days and nights, the miracle happens. While the form farmer slept, the seed germinated and grew into a plant. And once the seed was in the ground, there wasn't much more to do than wait. The parable even tells us that the farmer did not know how this happened, but thankfully it did. Well, this parable is a lesson about trust. We often get anxious in church. We worry about the trends of declining church attendance, and we worry about the budget. Are we going to have enough to pay our bills next year? The farmer could stay awake and worry about those seeds. Will they grow this year? But it doesn't help to worry or be anxious. Worry doesn't make it rain, and it certainly doesn't make the miracle of germination happen. Worry is really a colossal waste of time and energy. And the same is true for our anxiety about our future. This is God's garden, and growth is up to God. You and I need to do our part, but the rest is up to God. God will bring new people to check us out. God will open doors for us to serve the community. And if we are faithful to do our gardening chores, the growth will happen. So today, we bring our pledges, and then we go celebrate over lunch. We've done our part. The rest is up to God. So take a deep breath, everyone. It'll be okay. It's God's garden, remember? And finally, there is the parable of the mustard seed. And the message here is simple. It is stressing the point that God can make even the tiniest gifts and turn them into something beautiful and life-giving. It's a reminder that every seed matters. Whether it's uh, we need the five-figure pledges from folks that can do that, and if you can and are willing to, God bless you for that. But we also need the tiny pledges from children and youth and those who have limited resources. Wayne and Maria told a parable a few weeks ago about a simple gift a tiny seed, and how, if, it, if you will, it brought great joy to a group of orphans in Colombia. That's the parable of the mustard seed. 
The lesson is to be generous with what you have and God will do the rest of, with it and do it with abundance. As our fearless leader this year, Steve Bauer, has challenged us, our goal this year is not just meeting budget, it is abundance. And these parables remind us that God is all about abundance. The first parable, the parable of the sower, tells the story that once the seed fell on fertile ground, it produced a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. How would you like returns like that on your investments? In a good year, a farmer in those days could expect a sevenfold return. In fact, a, a return of 10 times the seeds planted would be considered a bumper crop. That would be abundance. So what do you call 30, 60, or 100-fold growth? You call it superabundance, or mega or abundance, or you call it God's garden. So are you ready? Are you ready to get down and dirty? Are you ready to spread seeds of God's love on good soil and the not-so-good? Are you ready to stop worrying and trust God? Are you ready to marvel at what God can do with even the tiniest seed? Are you ready to be a living parable of what God can do in and through us? Are you ready for the adventure of growing God's garden in 2019 and beyond? I know I am. In fact, I'm going to sit down now and get my pledge card ready. Oh, and remember, the more you sow, the more you reap. And I think I got that right, didn't I, Nancy? <laughs> Amen.